It's day five of Lost Caverns of Ixalan spoilers. Today we get a look at our blue gods, some super sweet dinosaurs, and a bunch of other stuff. Let's break them down. Hello everyone, it's Seth, probably better known as Saffron Olive, and it's time for another daily dose of Lost Caverns of Ixalan spoilers. And it might be the weekend, but spoiler season never sleeps. We don't have a huge number of cards to talk about today, but we do have some pretty spicy ones, which means we should probably jump right into it, start talking sweet new magic cards. Before we do, two quick reminders. First, if you need any of these cards, you can pre-order them from our sponsor, Card Kingdom, over at cardkingdom.com slash mtgoldfish. Second, to keep up on all the latest spoilers throughout the day, you should head on over to mtgpreviews.com. Anyway, let's talk some Lost Caverns of Ixalan. First up today, we got our blue mythic god in Ohir Pickpotic Deepest Epoch, which flips into Temple of Silical Time. So the front side, 4 mana, 4-3 four, fly. When you cast an instant spell from your hand, it gains rebound. If you don't know rebound, old mechanic from, I think, Rise of the Eldrazi was the first time it came out. When the spell resolves, it goes to exile. You get to cast it for free on your next upkeep. So essentially, you get to copy all of your instant spells they just have like suspend one once they resolve and then if it dies it returns tapped and transformed as a land with three time counters on it the land temple of silical time taps to add a blue mana and you remove a time counter and then once you get rid of all the time counters you can pay three and tap it and flip it back into o here so o here eh. I actually am not very impressed with this god. I actually think this card is like kind of medium to weak. I'm hoping I'm wrong because it's a cool card and I really like this god cycle. But there's a few reasons I think it's actually like not all that powerful. Also, why is this not a snake god? Look at that showcase edition. It is clearly a snake. When they printed the black god, it was a bat god. I'm not sure why this is not a snake god, but I don't know. Maybe there's some flavor reason I'm missing. So why do I think this card is kind of medium? So number one, there's a few reasons here. Number one is it's going to be really slow to flip back into god form. If you think about how this plays, let's say you play this on turn four. On turn five, your opponent kills it. You have to spend turn six, seven, and eight tapping and removing time counters. On turn nine, you can pay what is essentially four mana because you have to tap the land itself to get back into god form that is really really slow compared to a lot of the other gods which can almost immediately flip back around if certain conditions are met so if this dies once you gotta wait a long long time to actually turn it back into god form so that's one issue another issue and i think this is actually a good thing overall but it only rebounds instants it's weird that it doesn't rebound sorceries but i'm pretty sure i know why so in the past wizards has printed some some pretty sweet commanders that double spells copy spells but it turns out that in practice they're not all that sweet and they're really just extra turn commanders my guess is wizards left sorcery off this so it wouldn't just be another extra turn commander if this rebounded sorceries the optimal way to build this in commander would just be to play it with all the extra turn spells and like oh i play on here time warp two extra turns oh then temporal mastery two more extra turns expropriate all the extra turns it would be so miserable so even though the card is much less powerful powerful now that it can't cast sorceries or rebound sorceries uh, i think it's overall going to be a much more pleasurable card to play against because of that and it also makes it more of a deck building challenge like if this worked with instance and sorceries you could just jam it in a random deck and get value because it only works with instance you actually got to build around it a little bit so another reason i'm concerned about this one in standard is i'm not very impressed with a four mana four three flying body i know that sounds weird a four power flyer for four seems decent but if you think about it three toughness means it like trades down with harbin probably zephyr sentinel i guess it kind of gets through a fiend or chrome host cheat shark but in 2023 a four mana four three flyer is just not a very exciting stat line to me. And then if you look at control decks in standard, one of the big drawbacks of this is the most popular instance are counter spells, and counter spells don't really work very well with rebound. You can flashback removal, you can flashback like get lost, I'm sure we'll see a lot of play. Quick study, actually really nice card draw. So there are things you can do with it, and it does serve a purpose. Like you can definitely build a standard control deck with this being the centerpiece and the rebound pan being the centerpiece, but I don't think you can just take tier bank control or blue white control or esper control and jam in a bunch of ohirs and get enough value out of it you 
really need to build around this instant thing. You need a lot of powerful instants that are not counter spells, and there just isn't a deck like that that exists in standard right now. So this is gonna have to create its new archetype. Its best home might actually be in the Is It deck. I think maybe the most powerful thing you can do with this in standard is not play it like a control card, but play it like a spell slinger prowess style card, where you play O here and like play with fire, rebound it four damage for one mana, a lightning strike, rebound it six damage for two mana. You got instant speed card draw, like big score, thrill of possibility that you can rebound, uh, invoke calamity. I'm sure double invoke calamity. You gotta be able to do something busted with that. So maybe rather than being like a control card, maybe this is like a top end of some sort of is it prowess style deck in standard. As far as commander is concerned, the good news is you got 30 years of blue instance and there's plenty of them. If you wanna build around, oh, here's your commander. There's plenty of instant speed cantrips like brainstorm, mystical tutors, lots of instant speed removal, factor fiction for card draw. So you can certainly build a deck around it, but in commander, this kind of feels like watered down Tygum. It's kind of back to the extra turn thing. Like this kind of does what Tygum does, except Tygum gives you two colors and you can do the super miserable, take all the turn thing with Tygum because it rebounds sorceries. So all around, I think O here is just okay. Like it's a cool card. It just seems very narrow and very slow to flip back and forth. So it'll be interesting. I'm curious what y'all think about this one. Is this one better than I'm giving it credit for? Because right now, if I was gonna do like a tier list of the gods we've seen so far from Lost Caverns of Ixalan, I'm pretty sure O here would be like at the very bottom of the tier list. On the other hand, we do have a blue creature that I think is really good in Kaisal Larsenist. So Kaisal Larsenist, three mana, two, three, human pirate flying in ward one. When it ETBs for each player, you choose an artifact factor creature they control and for as long as it remains on the battlefield that permanent is a treasure and it loses all other abilities so this is essentially the closest thing we've seen to a blue brutal cathar type effect you play this you get to turn something of your opponents into a treasure it does say each player so in theory if you wanted to you could turn one of your things into a treasure although you probably won't most of the time i guess maybe there's some weird really desperate ramp scenario it also scales with commander so in commander you're gonna get the best thing from each opponent for three mana, which is pretty good. But we've never really seen a blue Brutal Cathar style effect. So it just comes down and temporarily answers the best creature artifact on your opponent's side of the battlefield. Kind of a little bit reminiscent of like Minimus Containment Imprisoned in the Moon. But I think this is a really powerful effect. It even has a little protection. I know Ward 1 isn't a big number, but we've seen on Rafine, like it does throw off the math on removal. It is something. That said, this is really a tempo play but I think that's fine if you look at pirates in standard they really kind of want to be a tempo tribe where you're getting in for like quick flying damage maybe countering some things disrupting your opponent this seems like a perfect addition to this package yes it's gonna die it's not a permanent removal spell it's not gonna get rid of the thing forever but maybe that's fine like you just play this and get a flying blocker out of the way and kill your opponent before they can get rid of the Kaisal Arsonist or shut down a shieldred for a couple of turns to avoid your opponent gaining life and close out the game so even though it's temporary I still think it's really strong. Other notable fact about this is it's a human pirate, which is probably mostly relevant for older formats where there's human decks, but this could be at least a sideboard option in some sort of five color human deck, maybe an historic or back in modern. Shuts down the One Ring, hitting an artifact is a nice upside for as long as this is on the battlefield, the One Ring's just a treasure, pretty harmless. The downside of this card, as I mentioned before, is it's really a tempo play. Like in every format, there's a lot of removal. Like in standard, you got Sunfall and Farewell and Cut Down and Abraid and get like There's so many ways to kill this. So don't think of this as a hard removal spell because it's not. Like, it will die. In pretty much every matchup, it is going to die. This is a card that you want to play and use as a tempo plan to be able to kill your opponent or push far ahead in the amount of time it remains on the battlefield. It's a temporary removal spell. But even being a temporary removal spell in the right deck can be really strong. So Kaisal Arsonist, I think this card's really good. Like, it's a containment priest style effect, but it's in blue and it has flying and it has ward. So I expect in pirates and maybe in older formats in humans, this card will actually see a decent amount of play and it scales nicely for commander because it targets each opponent. So in a four player game, you can treasure up the best thing of each of your opponents. We also got, apparently it's blue day in spoiler land, braided net slash braided quidip. I'm sure I said that wrong. Braided net, three mana, 
enters a battlefield with three net counters on it. You can tap it and remove a net counter from it to tap another target non-land permanent. Its activated abilities can be activated for as long as it remains tapped. And then you can craft it for two blue and an artifact. And then the backside is pay four mana, including one blue, tap it, draw a card for each artifact you control, then put braided quidip into its owner's library third from the top. So this card, the front side's kind of a souped up tumble magnet. You can deal with one thing per turn and it's gonna run out after three uses, unless you're proliferating or something, but normally you can use it for three turns. So this is a temporary answer. It is nice that activated abilities can be activated. That mostly will be helpful against planeswalkers. Uh, something like tumble magnet, I guess can't even target a planeswalker, but normally tapping a planeswalker doesn't do anything. But because this also gets rid of the activated abilities. If your opponent has a Quintorius Con or a Teferi, you can activate this on your opponent's upkeep, tap the Quintorius Con, and your opponent won't be able to activate its abilities. So that's a little nice bonus there as well. The backside of this card, though, is what really excites me. So I was actually surprised, as far as I could find, and if I'm missing something, let me know, I could not find another card in Magic with the text, draw a card for each artifact you control. We have it for humans and creatures with flying, or choose a creature type, or islands. There's a bunch of different things that are like, hey, draw a card for each of these. Never seen it for artifacts before. An artifact is actually a really, really scary line of text here for a couple of reasons. One is, artifacts can be pretty cheap and often produce mana. So think of a commander deck. A lot of commander decks are playing a bunch of mana rocks. So this is naturally going to be powered up. Also, you have dedicated like affinity style decks that get a ton of artifacts on the battlefield really quickly. In a deck like that, the backside of this can be drawing a ton of cards. Also, it doesn't say non-token. So in standard, this is working with blood tokens and treasure tokens and clue tokens and map tokens. We have all these mechanics that just add artifact tokens to the battlefield. So I can see this actually generating a ton of card advantage and that's actually what I'm most excited for. The front side is kind of like a, a weird medium removal spell but the back side should you be able to craft it is actually a huge source of card advantage in the right deck. The removal mode there is some upside here but like remember we're going into a standard where descending is a big thing like really cares about permanence. This is like not a great removal spell but it is a permanent so once it ends up in the graveyard it's going to help with your micro tyrant. It's going to trigger your descend stuff. We're also going to crafting format so you can play this and get some value out of it and then use it to craft with something else to get value out of it that way so there's a lot of synergies just for being a permanent i think in commander what this kind of reminds me of in a weird way is hilda's crown of winter hilda's crown of winter is a card that when i first saw i was like okay this is for a tap deck you play it in ronin tim and you play it in hilda whatever this is for a deck that's specifically based on tapping your opponent's creatures but then after i played it I realized, actually, no, this is just like an absurd source of card advantage. Like playing this, tapping something for a few turns and waiting until your opponents have five or six creatures tapped and then cashing in to draw a bunch of cards. That's actually a very legit line, even in a deck that isn't based around specifically tapping your opponent's stuff. Creatures get tapped all the time for, uh, you know, attacking and other abilities. So I think Braided Net might be kind of like that, where this looks like a card that's like super limited and narrow for an artifact deck. But when you think about command, decks and the amount of mana rocks and artifacts it'll just naturally show up treasure tokens clue tokens i think this will actually have a lot of homes and it seems very realistic that that backside is accidentally going to be like four mana draw eight cards or something absurd you know in the best case it's going to be four mana draw 20 cards 30 cards like treasures are pretty easy to make and make a lot of mana so i actually think this might be a much better commander card than people think the front side's fine is a weird temporary removal spell but the backside is actually a huge source of card advantage if you can get to it we also got a new vampire five drop in queen's bay paladin so five mana five four vampire knight when it etbs or attacks return up to one target vampire card from your graveyard to the battlefield with a finality counter on it and you lose life equal to its mana value so essentially five mana reanimate and you can do it again if you attack with it except you gotta lose a bunch of life along the way this is essentially like vampire phyrexian delver but also a little bit like sun titan i actually couldn't find a card that just like reanimates in the same exact way that this does but you get a phyrexian delver mode five mana reanimate a vampire and lose some life but then potentially if it sticks around you can do it multiple times by attacking with it this card 
is interesting. So obviously, if you're going to be playing it, you got to be a vampire deck. It only really does anything with vampires. And vampires, it can be pretty scary. Like, even just in standard right now, we got Galta and Maverick. We got Lord Xander. We got Olivia Crimson Bride for double reanimation. These are all really big, powerful vampires that are worth reanimating. Yeah, you're going to lose a bunch of life if you reanimate one of them, but it hasn't stopped, like, reanimate from being a thing in Legacy. The other possibility is maybe you don't try to reanimate huge vampires with this. Maybe this is more of a synergy piece for the sack vampire deck, like Vito wanting a bunch of things to be sacrificed that's going to put vampires in your graveyard so you can make this big vampire demon token, and then Queen Bay Paladin comes down and reanimates something. You get value out of it that way. So this seems like a fine value card. I'm actually not sure like how much of an impact it'll make on standard or 60 card formats, but at a minimum, it seems like a nice addition to any vampire commander deck, and vampires are like super popular in commander. So if you're playing Edgar Markov or Evelyn or Strefan or whatever, seems like a nice little addition to get back one of your vampires and maybe multiple Zephystics around. Plus in commander, when you have 40 life, losing some life to reanimate something, not much of a concern. We also got a new vehicle in subterranean schooner so two mana three four vehicle when it attacks target creature that crewed it gets to explore and it crews for one so this card oh when i first saw it, i was like this is about as close as we've gotten to a smuggler's copter in quite a while so you have this two mana vehicle with above the curve stats that can draw you a card when it attacks and it only crews for one. So it's a lot of marks of being a playable vehicle. On the other hand, it doesn't have any sort of evasion. And if you look at vehicles that see play in Constructed, they typically all have evasion. Either that or it's like Azika's Chariot and just makes so many bodies, you don't even care. But really they're mostly evasive vehicles. So I'm, I'm really on the fence. I see good stats, cheap crewing, card advantage ability, graveyard feeling ability, growing other creatures this card has a lot going for it but i do wonder if not having flying is going to be something that holds it back a little bit but still i think this is the best vehicle that we've seen from the set so far so obviously mech titan core keeps getting better if you want to live the dream and the meme of trying to transform into mech titan uh, this is another nice vehicle for the deck but really this seems like a card for some sort of explore deck i love that the crew cost is only one that makes it really easy to turn this on and gives you some explosive lines where you're like setting Night Scout, Explorer, turn two, Subterranean Schooner. Next turn, you can use your useless 1-1 one, one to crew this 3-4, get in, do some more exploring, creep growing the scout. So if you're a deck that cares about exploring, this goes up in value. Could also just be like a pretty good mono blue, super annoying, counter all your stuff type of card. Like Hypnotic Grifter, Thousand Face Shadow. These cards, super cheap, can crew it. You can throw combat research, start, you know, snowballing, countering everything. So Subterranean Schooner, I think it might have a shot. Remember, we're in a standard where Surviving Sun fall is a really really big deal there's so many of these sweepers and vehicles are a good way to dodge sorcery speed sweepers unfortunately farewell what a mistake. It's everything. There's no playing around Farewell. It punishes you, whether you're a schooner or a creature. But still, I think Subterranean Schooner, this is a vehicle that we've seen from this set that I think has the highest odds of actually being standard playable. Still, we'll have to wait and see. I've been burnt a lot by vehicles ever since we went to Kamigawa. So many of the vehicles in Kamigawa look so good. It looks so strong. And they just really haven't made it in standard. So that gives me pause. But this looks like a playable card. Good stats, cheap crewing card advantage ability that's pretty much everything you want out of a vehicle except for evasion we also got our Rakdos creature land in restless vet so etb stat makes black or red can pay three to turn it into a black and red insect token with menace it's a two three and then when it attacks you can discard a card and draw a card and I'm running out of things to say about these creature lands. I like them. I think creature lands are really powerful, doubly so in a standard with Sunfall and Farewell. I think this card will see a lot of play. If you're a mid-ranger control deck that are in these colors, some number of these is probably going to be correct. I like that it has Menace. I like that it's only three to activate, and Rummaging when you attack is a surprisingly strong ability. Goes up a little more in value in graveyard decks if you're trying to descend, let's say, or reanimate. But I feel like this is a card that, as long as you're not super aggro and can afford some some tap lands really really solid creature land for standard we also got an exciting reprint in resplendent angel and i gotta give wizards a huge shout out one thing we've asked about a lot or asked for 
for a lot is more reprints in full supply standard sets. We get a lot of reprints, but a lot of times it's in like super expensive commander masters or super limited supply, you know, whatever special treatment products. This is a normal standard set. And we've seen Cavern of Souls, like a $50 card, Gishath, a $50 card, Lost Caverns of Itlamok, that's like a $20 card. Even like Treasure Map is a few bucks. Resplendent Angel is just another really nice high value reprint. It's around $25, $30 because of Pioneer you're playing angel decks and it's also a sweet card a three mana three three with flying at the beginning of each end step if you gain five or more life you get to make a four four and then you can pay six mana to give it plus two plus two in lifelink which is enough to make it a five five lifelinker and trigger its own ability so resplendent angel outside of just being a good value reprint has some homes in standard so we still have angels in standard giada is still kind of a messed up card because rotation got canceled this year all these pieces still exist so i imagine that if you're trying to make angels work this is a really nice new addition to your Yada Angel deck. Angel's got enough lifelink. You should be able to make its ability work. The other place I'm really excited for this is trying to make Orzhov Soul Sisters in standard. We talked about this a little bit yesterday, but now we got Amelia and we got Voice of the Blessed. We got a couple of pseudo Soul Sisters in Lunark Fenton, Alice Elcor, Resplendent Angel, another really strong addition to some sort of life gain deck where this is a good flyer that also can get lifelink and also make more bodies. So really excited to try it there as well. But mostly, I'm just really hyped to see Wizards dumping all these 20, 30, 50 dollar cards into a standard set, which is really going to get their prices down regardless of where you're going to play them. As far as box toppers, just one today. It's Temple Bell. It's another one you probably don't really want to open. It's been reprinted in like a million commander decks, so it is not very valuable, but uh, eh, it's got some cool art at least. As far as lower rarity cards, got a handful that I think are worth mentioning. Scytheclaw Raptor card kind of interests me as a sideboard card three mana four three it's a dinosaur it's got decent stats and then it says whenever a player casts a spell if it isn't their turn scythe call raptor deals four damage to them so essentially this is the card that's really good at punishing opponents for playing at instant speed if your opponent is going to counter one of your spells they have to take four if they want to kill something at instant speed they have to take four so i feel like this could be a nice option either in dinosaurs or in some sort of mono red deck just to kind of hate on the control deck a little bit like four damage is actually a very meaningful chunk so this might mean that your opponent just can't afford to do things at instant speed which is a nice value so i think that the combination of reasonable stats and a very powerful in specific matchup ability at least has this card in the conversation for standard play speaking of dinosaurs we also got earth shaker dread maw apparently a colossal dread maw all grown up six mana six six trample except it has an ability now when it etbs you draw a card for each other dinosaur you control so this is kind of like a a regal force for dinosaurs it's a colossal dread mall that actually has an ability uh, i feel like this card pretty good for a dinosaur deck the downside of earth shaker dread mall of course and we've talked about this before is dinosaurs tend to be kind of expensive regal force used to be really good in elves but elves is like all one mana mana producers uh earth shaker dread mall not gonna be as explosive because dinosaurs are like three mana five mana eight mana so it's gonna be hard to play too many of them too quickly but still Still, if you're playing a dinosaur commander deck and maybe even in standard like six mana six six trample that draws you a couple of cards when it etbs that's still a lot of value so i think dinosaur commander decks for sure want earth shaker red maw and i could see it having a role in standard dinos as well we also got bat cavern so bat cavern three mana enchantment when it enters a battlefield you make a one one black bat creature token move flying for each mana from a cave spent to cast it and then when it a cave enters the battlefield under your control. You can put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature you control. So this is worth mentioning just because it's one of the best cave payoffs we've seen so far. If you use three caves to cast this, you're going to end up getting three one, one flyers for three mana, which is a really good rate. That's like spectral procession for caves, essentially. And then you get the bonus of getting counters on your stuff as caves come into play. This reminds me a little bit of gate payoffs. So we've seen in the past, like gates of blaze guild summit be that engine of gate stacks we'll have to see caves are brand new it took gates like a couple of sets to get to the point of really being strong enough to compete as a deck i don't know if caves will get there in one set but i think this is the closest thing we've seen to like a reason to play a whole bunch of caves together in a single deck so far so keep an eye out for this if there's a couple more payoffs like this it could be possible that building like an all cave mana base or cave dot deck could actually be a thing to do in standard we also got 
Market Gnome, and I love cards like this. Just a one mana white zero three. When it dies, you gain a life and draw a card. And if it's exiled from the battlefield while you're activating a craft ability, you can gain a life and draw a card. So Market Gnomes, it's a little bit like a Thraben Inspector or something. Yes, it doesn't really do it. It's a zero three, just comes down in blocks, but you can sacrifice it and draw a card off of it. So it's great sacrifice fodder. You can craft it and draw a card and gain a life out of it. So I feel like this is a card that has enough synergies that it's probably going to have a role. One thing I've learned is never sleep on one drops that can draw a card because they're usually going to punch up above their weight class and do way more than you expect. So I think market gnomes, it's not something you're going to jam in any deck. It's not aggressive at all. So if you're trying to play like white aggro, you definitely don't want this card. But I think there are going to be sack homes or craft homes that actually use this as just a nice little synergy engine piece. Of course, we also got a bunch of, you know, draft chap limited stuff that you can check out over on mtgpreviews.com. Anyway, that brings us to the end of our daily dose of Lost Caverns of Vixalon spoilers for today. So let me know what you think of all these new cards. Kind of a light day, but man, it's the weekend. You don't get as many spoilers on the weekend. Thanks for watching, everyone. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll be back maybe tomorrow, probably Monday though, because I don't know if I'll have enough spoilers for a video tomorrow, but I'll be back most likely on Monday with another daily dose of Lost Caverns of Ixalan spoilers. Until then, have a spectacular weekend, everyone, and I will talk to you soon. Looking for even more magic? Well, check out yesterday's Much of Brew, where we found out if Up the Beanstalk is really as broken as everyone says in modern, and you can also find yesterday's daily spoiler video right here.